Hello, my name is Dan Skabown, and this is another episode of the 52 must-see movies and why they matter on this nice, wonderful evening. We are going to be talking about one of the all-time great films. Uh, you don't use the word epic very often, but in this case, we're going to use the word epic because this is an absolute epic of a film and with me to discuss this great epic of a film um i'm gonna say it after i introduce this gentleman right here his name is uh, andrew cabral andrew how are you this evening i am doing epic dan epic is the word of the day um biblical epic if you want to make it a little more specific but yeah we're here to talk about a big one um there are several epics that we uh, have to go through throughout our 52 must-see movie series, and this is one of the bigger ones, more, one of the more more well-known ones. I think even if you haven't seen this particular movie, um, you will uh, definitely know its name. It, it is a rather popular story in general. Uh, Dan, you want to reveal it, even though people can just read the title? Yeah, uh, we are talking about the 1959 Best Picture winner, Ben-Hur. And uh, I want to read off some stats about this film. Uh, before we get into the plot and the story, I'm going to read off a few stats. You want to talk about staggering? Listen to these stats. 100,000 extras. 8,000 costumes. 300 sets this is in an era where you didn't use a computer to come up with backdrops and sets and all this kind of stuff you know we have the guillermo del toros of today where he likes to build his own sets a lot of the times and sometimes marvel will build parts of sets and things like that but they will fill in the background with green screen and computer graphics Back in the 1950s and 60s and 40s, they did it all by hand. All of this is practical. And when you watch the movie, it really stands out how amazing and how epic this film is. And Ben Hur, um, there's a gentleman in the film. You may know him. He's pretty good with the NRA, but uh, he was great as a movie. A movie actor before that, Charlton Heston plays Judah Ben Hur. And basically, this is his story, but it has a kind of weaving story of uh, Jesus of Nazareth as well throughout this story. Um, Andrew, what I mean, just what are your thoughts about <clears throat> the stats that I said? Charlton Heston, the, the, the main character of this film. Just your opening thoughts about, yeah. you know, we yeah. talk about essential and, and must-see and all these. This is, it checks off all those boxes. Yeah, this movie is very much a spectacle in every sense of the term. Um, it's, it's, like Dan said, just massively produced on a large scale. You know, they, they did have some, they didn't have CGI back in the day. They didn't have... Uh, the things we have now, not even close. They had certain things. They had, like, rear projection. You see a lot of rear projection back in the day when, you know, two people are driving in a car, and you can see that the background outside is completely fake. That's rear projection. Sometimes they would use matte paintings uh, in the background, and you could tell they're matte paintings because nothing's moving in them. But they use some of that stuff in here. But a lot of it is, like, like you said, handmade, costuming, makeup, to large giant sets um charlton heston um is kind of a a mainstay with biblical epics you know he did this film and he also did uh the ten commandments as well another biblical epic um this film is interesting because it is a biblical epic but it's based on a novel it's based on a book called um uh ben-hur a tale of the christ uh, which was written by uh, Lou Wallace in 1880. And this was also a story that was adapted several times. Um, there was one, I think, done in 1907 as a movie, a silent film, of course, 1925 as a silent film, 1959, which is 
the main one and I think the best one. Another one was done, I think, 2003, which was like, a, I think it was a TV miniseries. And then, of course, we just got a more recent one in 2016 of Ben-Hur as well. Um, what is interesting is that this one is the best. And before we go any further, um, just, I guess, maybe get this out of the way. Um, these, uh, the, these biblical films back in the day, most of Hollywood back in the day, the characters were all whitewashed. They were all be done by um, white actors and actresses. Uh, here you'll have people with English accents and they're supposed to be from, you know, Rome 2000 years ago. <laughs> it really, it's, it's, it's comical when you think about it. And that is the, the kind of the circumstance of which Hollywood dealt with for a very long time and is still uh, actually dealing with today, uh, whitewashing a lot of these ethnic uh, specific characters. And, you know, Judah Ben-Hur is supposed to be um, an Israeli person, you know, circa 2000 years ago uh, from modern day Israel. And it's, you know, it's Charlton Heston, it's white Charlton Heston and all the other characters are white. And it, that's just unfortunately the case in this film. I mean, it, it's definitely a negative throughout because it's kind of comical, like I said, but it doesn't take away from a lot of the other positives of the film. Like Dan said, this production is incredible. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the epics of all epics. It's not personally my favorite epic, but it's impressive, even from modern day standards, just to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's so, some of the things you talk about. There's, there's a phrase that I always like to use with certain things, and it's called suspension of disbelief. If the story, the acting, like all the things involved, the costumes, the sets, the all the things that are involved in the film capture you and, and affect you and and get your attention then you can you can let things go such as whitewashing so we're not going to discuss whitewashing anymore in this because no, we I, have yeah. i just wanted to make like make you know acknowledge the fact that a lot of those movies back then were whitewashed yeah no you're absolutely right i, I i'm not going to take anything away from you on that one um it's the truth and uh a guy by the name of william wyler directed this you and me and Ian and Stephen have had our chance to talk a little bit about this guy. Um, let's talk about the director before we get into the plot. Yeah. Story. St Stephen and I have already discussed two of his films in this series. Uh, one was Roman Holiday and the other was The Best Years of Our Lives. And it's very interesting that of uh, the 52 movies, I think he is got to be the director with the most films. And that, you know, all of the all of the other directors are you know well known and great but he's the one with three out of the 52 and he's a great director i think william wyler is one of the best probably of all time and at, at least uh when it comes to the golden age of film i mean he did a lot of great films he's he won uh three oscars throughout his career and was nominated for a bunch of other ones so he was definitely really well known at least well known now to cinephiles Absolutely. All right. So the plot, I'm going to, you know, kind of move through the plot as fast as I can here. It, it is a long on, movie. Yeah. We're going to touch on some key points as far as that goes. Um, and like all the other 52 must see movies and why they matter, we will spoil the film. If you have not seen Ben Hur, what are you doing watching this video? <laughs> Go and get a copy of Ben Hur or watch it on. You probably can get it for free on um, on demand. Sometimes um, TCM movies uh, will get, allow you to get a lot. Uh, they have their own library that's free, and you can just on demand. And this might be one of them. I'm not sure. Or it could be like three bucks or something like that. Really dirt cheap if you have not seen Ben Hur. Um, all right, so we got this affluent man in Jerusalem, um, played by obviously Charlton Heston, Judah Ben Hur, and. Um, Basically, he's the kind of the the, the big shot, big businessman. He's he, everybody loves him. He's, he's got a family, a mother, and a sister, and he he has some people that work for him. And then the Romans come in, and you know the Romans come into Jerusalem because supposedly the people aren't doing what they're told, and they have some religious uh, people that aren't necessarily. Uh, conforming to what the romans want them to do yeah. it's kind of funny at the beginning because like 
no figure. Go figure. They don't yeah. want to do this. Would have a movie if they just did what you told them to do yeah. and bow down and blah blah blah. Yeah, this, this was at the time at the height of the Roman Empire, where Rome owned a good portion of the world, including uh, the Middle East, and a lot of uh, the political problems. The reason why Rome, you know, eventually fell because they they had so many so much power in so many domains they couldn't hold it for so long and uh the middle east is one of those areas and like dan said judah ben-hur plays a wealthy prince and merchant uh in is in in um in jerusalem at the time and one and one day a a new uh a person's going to be leading the garrison and happens to be a childhood friend of his who, who they grew up together and his name is masala i believe Yep, Masala, played by, um, I have his name here, right here, Stephen Boyd. Stephen Boyd plays Masala. And, you know, if, if, at first he kind of buddies up to him and acts like, oh, I miss you. Oh, man. And then he sees his sister and, you know, sister has goo-goo eyes towards him. So she's like, oh, yeah, we've been waiting for him to come into town. And, of course, they buddy. And then a, some time goes by, and then all of a sudden he's like, hey, remember what I talked to you about? About, hey conforming to what we're doing as the Romans and so forth. And needless to say, Judah ben is like, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to yeah, do he, what we want to do. Yeah, he <laughs> want like, Judah ben Hur is kind of a, he's kind of neutral. He's not part of uh, the freedom revolution that's going on at the time. He knows people in it. He, you know, they're, 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 they're people he, he's probably known his whole life. And his buddy, Masala, wants him to basically inform on him. It's like, you know, who who are the leaders? What are they doing? And he's like, I'm I'm not part of this. I don't want anything to do with any of this. And, and then, then what hap what happens is the the new governor comes uh to Jerusalem, you know, taking place of the old one, and there's this huge parade down, I believe, this main street, and uh Judah and his sister are watching on a rooftop. And in one of the more contrived parts of the movie, uh one of the uh shingles falls off and it happens to drop right in front of the horse of the new governor and the horse gets spooked and the governor falls off the horse and they think it's an assassination attempt on the governor and they see where it came from they see uh they see uh ben hur up there and so they go and arrest him yeah well irony is one of my favorite things in film and books you know you know how much i love irony i'm sure you're a fan of irony as well this is very ironic that this happens to happen right then. And of course, he ends up taking the blame for his sister who basically knocked the tile off the roof by accident. And, you know, it's clearly an accident. Of course, he tells Masala, it was an accident. Please, you have to understand, we did not do this on purpose. We had no malicious intent to uh, hurt the governor. And he was like, now take them all. Leave the slaves. They can stay here. <laughs> Leave all the, the housemaids and the servants and stuff. You guys could stay. So he ends up putting, um, getting Judah Ben-Hur on a ship, a galley ship, and then putting his mother and sister in a, a dungeon. And we don't see them for quite a while. No, there, there, a, lot of, a lot of time goes by in between... Um, uh, but by the time he gets arrested and then sent off basically to be a prisoner sl uh, doing slave type work, basically uh, being part of a rowing uh, group of yeah. people who, who are just prisoners and slaves, just rowing oh, away yeah. relentlessly. And he yeah. says that, yeah, he says that it's been, I think, three and a half years he's been doing this, this thing. Um, and that's kind of where. And that's when we get to the middle portion of this three and a half hour epic. <laughs> it's there's a lot there's a lot going on, and what ends up happening is the ship that he's on is is being captained or led by um, a guy what by the name the of Arius, who is a consul of Rome, who is someone who's a a, a, a higher up politician basically. And he sees like potential in Ben Hur. He sees a determination. He wants to basically take him from that ship and make him a gladiator and a chariot racer and stuff like that. But Ben Hur's like, no, I, um, I don't want to do it. But what ends up happening is essentially they get attacked, I believe, by like Macedonians or something like that, or pirates of some kind. 
and Judah ends up saving this consul's life. And so when they get rescued, they end up going back to Rome. Uh, basically, this consul adopts uh, Ben Hur as his son, and he's in these, and now his life is a lot more better than a lot much better than when he was this prisoner slash slave. Yeah, John, Jack Hawkins plays uh, Lutus Aurelius, and like you said, it, he has an ulterior motive. He lost a son, and he looks at Judah Ben Hur as like a son, and so he decides, you know what? I'm going to adopt you. Yeah, you're a grown man, and you've had a long life up to this point, but I'm going to adopt you, and you're going to be my new son. And here's this ring to uh, basically tie this bond that we have. Now, I'm father and you're son, and any of my riches and property and everything that I have now, if I die, goes to you. And so – the thing is, he knows because he looks in his eyes. When he's on the ship, he sees in his eyes. And he and it before he finally makes his his decision, his faithful decision to leave, Quintus really sees it in his eyes. You're gonna leave. And he's like, Yes. Because he knows the mission he has. He knows this mission that he's had, even when he was on the galley ship, what he wants to do. And so we find he starts traveling, and he ends up running into some um, some guys in the middle of the desert. Um, you know, Sheik. One of the guys is Sheik. Uh, let me see if I can. Sheik Ilderium. Ilderium. Yeah. Ilderium. Sheik Ilderium. Now, this is a funny guy. <laughs> he he starts looking at like his horse handler, and he doesn't know what he's doing, and the horses are running off the track, and of course. Judah Ben Hur just standing there watching. He's like, "Yep, yeah, you're gonna take the horse from the inside, put it on the on the outside, or the poor horse from the outside, put it on the inside. That'll control the other horses, and you'll be able to. Oh, you have an eye for this? Yes, I I did horse chariot racing in Rome. Oh, really? Yep, I I raced for Quintus Aurelius. Oh, okay. How does a Jew end up in? So basically, he tells them the law. The long or the short of the story, we're not going to go repeat what we just went over. <laughs> he's a lot of buddies with this guy, and um, needless to say, he ends up talking to him about Masala, and Masala is a horse chariot guy in Jerusalem, and supposedly he's the best. But you got to be careful about this one thing: there's no rules in the chariot. In the chariot races, anything goes. So you got to be very careful. So he ends up leaving the sheik and going back to back. Jerusalem. Yeah, he's going back to Jerusalem. And um, we didn't touch upon this, but the story itself weaves in and out of the time of Jesus Christ. And it, it goes along the biblical tale that we that many of us grew up hearing, you know, him going throughout um Israel and preaching and all that kind of stuff, and he put and he shows up a few times during the film. He showed up once uh, after um, he after he was in prison and he was being sent uh, to to prison. He, you know, they made this long trek along the desert and they stopped somewhere, and the and the guy basically running these guys wasn't going to give them any water, but Jesus did that. Um, and and you know, all throughout the film, we keep hearing about the name of Jesus hearing about this new preacher from Nazareth, you know, preaching all these things and his message and whatnot. And it's all interwoven throughout the film. If anything, the two, the biblical story and the story of Judah Ben-Hur kind of run parallel to one another and intersecting at several times. And by the time he returns back, when he's returning back to Judea, they're actually, um, the chariot race is in honor of the new governor of, of, the new governor there and that it happens to be Pontius Pilate. And if you're familiar with the biblical tale, you know how, you know, the role of Pontius Pilate in there. And it's very interesting how these, these things uh, tend to overlap with one another. And he's buddies with Quintus area. So he kind of knows um, Judah Ben-Hur because they were introduced when he was quote unquote, his adopted son. So when we get back to Jerusalem, we have a couple we – we're getting introduced to a couple characters that we hadn't seen in a while, and that's um, 
what is her name? I got her name right. Esther. 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 Esther uh, Haya Harriet. Is her name? Haya Harriet is her name, the actress that plays Esther. And she's been living in his house, which is disheveled and ramshackle. And her father is living in there with, with her because her father was questioned pretty badly and finally gave up. He The one thing he didn't give up was where Judah ben -Hur's fortune was, which is, I don't know how he did it, but he was able to get away with not giving away the fortune. But he was pretty um, interrogated, pretty good. But he ends up back with his daughter, and they Judah ben -Hur talks to them, and basically he tells her why he's – there and all his whole whole story basically yeah there's and a little romance going on between the yeah. esther character and the judah ben Hur character that was established earlier on in the film uh, before, he got, before he got arrested and anything they they had a little thing going on because she was supposed to actually uh had an arranged marriage that she was supposed to uh fulfill and she never did because her and her father never left jerusalem in all this time so like four years i believe have passed since the beginning of the film yeah so we kind of we if you if if you see that scene where she's like he's he frees her because technically her father and her are a slave of Judah Ben Hur, he frees her and says, "Here, this ring is my my promise that you're free and until you marry somebody, blah blah blah." Well, we kind of kind of looked at her eyes, we kind of looked at his eyes, and they had kind of goo goo eyes towards each other, <laughs> like. You, you saw this coming that there might be some some kind of connection later on in the film and there was it basically they basically love each other and she didn't marry she uses this excuse because she had to take care of her father but you know, yeah it's it's, yeah, it's, it, it's old hollywood there's always a big romance in these epics you know yeah and um so unbeknownst to judah ben her he comes back looking for his mother and sister but she ends up finding them because they come to her house the house and they hide out and say don't tell judah don't tell him that we're alive because when when he he goes to um masala and he says i want to know where my mother and sister are or you're in trouble and blah 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 he's gonna you know he gives them a nice and he basically say hey this knife is basically for you to kill yourself because you're going to die if you don't tell me where my sister and mother are. And basically they find them in the dungeons and they have turned into lepers. Right. And so the lepers, they don't want anything to do with Judah anymore because they don't want him to see them like that. But they do hide out in the house and tell Esther, hey, tell him not to come looking for us, that we're dead. And then they go to this valley of the lepers. They get this whole valley where it's a valley of the lepers. Yeah. So they're, they they kind of take off. That leads us into part two. This is a two part movie. This uh, a, again, part two is mostly the big thing that everybody knows this movie for, and that is the chariot race, which, upon rewatching it, is still incredible to watch today in today's lens. It is amazing. It's grand. It's a spectacle, and the film. You know, we we're saying that, but you kind of have to watch it to understand. Everything in the movie is kind of um, stretched out. You know, when they have the opening kind of getting ready ceremonies for this grand chariot race, they show you the whole thing. It's it's large and it's long and it's impressive to watch. And the chariot race is incredible. The chariot race is, you know... It's fast, it's quick, but the editing is done so tightly. Everything is is so well done that it really uh, eclipses a lot of the action moments in films today. Yeah, this is considered one of the greatest action scenes in the history of film. We see stuff in Fast and the Furious and the Marvel movies and Star Wars and some, I mean, that are like, will blow your mind. But this is considered... For the time, you have to remember when this film, 1959, this is incredible how they were able to do this. Get the horses, get the chariots, do it, then edit it together and make it all work. And it is some of the best stunt work. And, you know, back then, stuntmen were really a huge part of Hollywood. 
they're a huge part of Hollywood today, but they're not as big of a part of Hollywood today, in my opinion, as they were back then, because they had to do a lot of different things with cars and horses and like this movie was chariots. And so a lot of the, I mean, scenes were just incredible. Guys were being ran over by horses and chariots and they were bloody and, and they were being thrown off the chariots into walls. Yeah, I mean, you you could crazy. die during these chariot races, and many yeah. people did. It was very much akin to uh, gladiatorial games, where it's life or death. You know, you lose, you die, <laughs> but yeah. sometimes. And it's it's impressive to see them pull that off at that time, and it's incredible the effects they do because everything's practical, and the whole film is shot in a rather interesting aspect ratio of two six six one. That is like cinemascope, but like super cinemascope. It's very, very wide, and everything is just, you know, on that grand scale. Um, the lenses that they used in these films are still around today. Um, Quentin Tarantino famously used the same lens they used on Ben Hur for his new movie, The Hateful Eight, a couple of years ago. And it, that whole movie was also shot on film. He really wanted to preserve, you know, the era of cinemascope. He's kind of an old school guy like that. So you can definitely see the influence of Ben Hur just on filmmaking in today's cinema as well. Cinemascope is still used, not to necessarily this that specific aspect ratio but it's definitely still used in a lot of bigger movies yeah they uh it's called panavision and metro color and you know if you watch this film you're like wow how real realistic does it how it jumps off the screen well that's the reason why metro color and panavision it really is like yeah. in your face it was definitely but made for the big screen like the big screen spectacle you have to remember at the time um, 1959 television was taking a lot of audience from the theaters, so they needed to have new gimmicks and new things to get people to go to the movies. That's why you see a lot of these epics showing up in the 50s and 60s. They needed something new to get these people into the theaters, and they needed to make these films longer and bigger and more of an adventure to you know maximize exposure. And it, it's an incredible time in cinema history because you have all of these, you know, you have the invention of widescreen basically in the mid 1950s taking over. And then you have kind of widescreen becoming the standard pretty much from the 50s all the way up till now. It's, it's, it's very interesting if you traverse the history of cinema. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have the giant chariot race. You know, of course, our, our good guy's going to win, you know, and the bad guy's going to lose. But that's not the end of the film. You think, okay, oh. No, there's like another hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> you know? The film is over. This is it. We're not going to have any more. The, the good guy wins. The bad guy loses. Nope. We go back to this storyline involving the mother and the daughter. He cannot not, he can't take no for an answer, basically. He, he has to find the mother and the daughter. And so one day he follows. Well, yeah, before we get to that, though, we have to mention that he, the whole reason he did the chariot race was to get revenge on Masala, and he does defeat him, and Masala ends up dying because of uh, the wounds he gets in, in, in the chariot race. There's a great scene right after the chariot race, before he goes on to discover his mother and sister. Uh, the final exchange between the two is particularly powerful and, and really well done. Yeah, and that's how he ends up. Fi uh, he follows Esther, but he does get from masala one last nugget of information that his sister and mother are lepers and they're in the valley of the lepers but he doesn't know how to get there so he follows esther and esther basically takes him to them and she catches him following her and she's like no no you can't do it you can't go in there you know they're lepers you know you you have to yeah. stay away but he just doesn't take no for an answer. And eventually he goes in there and he sees his mother and his daughter and they're like, no, get away yeah, from us. Leave us alone. Yeah, he does leave there. He does leave there and he he does go back later later on. Um, he go. He, I, I can't remember. Yeah, he, he goes. At one point he goes back to Rome and basically rejects uh, that that offer from Arius, you know, the idea of becoming his son, becoming his heir, 
and essentially becoming a Roman. And what is interesting is that Judah Ben-Hur, I think uh, at this point in the film, he's been battling with, you know, do am I a, do I become a Roman or do I go back to my roots uh, as as a Jew, as someone who grew up in this area? And then, but 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 going through all of that stuff, going back to Jerusalem, he comes to the conclusion that he's going to stay true to who he is. I mean, it, it's a very interesting character uh, part of the story. Yeah, and so what happens is he knows of a Messiah, if you will. Well, before that, before that, I don't, I, I don't want to cut you off, Dan, but uh, he, that's when he goes back to and visits. And what happens is his sister is, he goes back there and he finds out that his sister is not doing well, that she's actually, you know, dying, if you will, because leprosy is a slow moving disease. For those of you who don't know who, what leprosy is, basically your, your skin is rotting and you slowly die. At the time there was, they didn't know any, any types of cures or anything like that. And there's an interesting, I've always viewed the lepers as a great um, kind of allegory or metaphor for outcasts in society. You know, as we've mentioned, they, 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 they kick all of them out of the towns and they basically all live in this valley of caves to die. <laughs> you know, no, but there's no compassion for them. There's no one helping them. They're outcasts in society. No one likes them. And they, and the word leper is still used today to signify that, you know, if someone's a leper, you know, that's someone who is an outcast. And it's interesting how they, they work that into the film as well. And that's, and, and that's when he goes back, he takes his sister who's died. He goes into the leper cave where basically this is a giant tomb of where people are going to die. And you can contract leprosy rather easily. So he's risking a lot, but at this point he really doesn't care. His main goal throughout the movie was to get back to his family, his mother and his sister and get back home. And that's, and he, and he, and then after this, as Dan was about to mention, is the, we've been hearing about this Jesus character throughout the whole film. Dan. And so he basically thinks, okay, well, this guy is a miracle worker and he can do all these different things. So I'm going to take my sister and my mother back to Jerusalem until he finds out that there is a trial. He gets to town and everybody's, there's nobody around. <laughs> and they're like, where is everybody? Well, there's a trial for the uh, the Messiah, the, you know, Jesus. And he was like, oh, really? And so he goes in, everybody's inside, and you see Jesus um, with a cross, walking with a, with a cross. And then there's another guy who's strung up on a cross, and they're carrying that, that guy. And um, he basically, basically gets there. He, yeah. He gets there just in time for the crucifixion. Yeah. <laughs> And it's interesting how it's it's Passover, a Jewish holiday, but I guess he didn't know about it. It's it's another one of those things. It's you know a Hollywood movie, but he gets there at, at you know at the worst possible time because you know at, at, they they believe that you know you're gonna go to be crucified, you're going to die, you know, and and he gets there just in time for that. And he he and his sister, he his sister and mother are and Esther are along the you know the route of which the, you know, people are going to Golgotha, the place where they, where they crucified people. And it, and it's, and he recognizes, I believe at one point he recognizes who he is because he's seen him before earlier on in the film that we mentioned. Yeah. So basically he's like, Oh man, what am I going to do? And he, he doesn't know what to do at that point because the guy that's, he thought was going to try to help him can't help him anymore. And then they fast forward in the film to them in a cave, um, basically the mother and the daughter in a cave, and lightning and rain and storms and whatnot, and all of a sudden their leprosy is cured, and he's gone. Jesus is not there anymore, and they're cured, and they don't know what how how it, this happened. Right, right. They don't know how this happened. And that's pretty much the end of the film. Um, I mean, that's pretty much the end. Yeah, of the film. Esther, Esther and uh, he have like a, another kind of heart to heart conversation, another romantic type scene um, at the end of the film. And that pretty much wraps up all of Ben-Hur. 
and it they, we're not doing it quite justice because I think it's it's more of an experience, you know what I mean, watching the movie than it is kind of just us talking about it generally. There's a lot of things going on in it, and it's very much a character story. The movie is called Ben Hur uh, uh, after the character of Judah Ben Hur. It, there's a lot of you know there's a huge gigantic character arc in it. The movie is three and a half hours long. And what is interesting is I thought it was a lot longer, but compared to some other epics, it's actually not that long, and it moves at a very quick pace. That was one thing I found was very interesting is how quickly it moved. You know, especially that second half, that chariot scene pushes the film really quickly forward. Yeah, well, that second part of the film is basically two things: the chariot race. And him trying to find his parent, his mother, and his sister, and trying to help them. Those are the two main parts of the story, basically, in the second part of the story. The first story, part of the story, there was a lot going on. You could have easily made a movie of the first half of the story without even having the second half of the story, because there's a lot going on in the first half of the story, you know. But they add the chariot race. They add all the stuff involving him looking for his sister and his mother in the in the love interest story with Esther. Now, I mean, of all the great epics, this one won eleven Academy Awards. It won Best Director, Best Actor, uh, Best Picture. You know, it basically up until Titanic, it won the most Oscars of any film. Until Titanic surpassed it, um, yeah. No, no, no. Film has won more than eleven. Um, Titanic, like you said, and then Return of the King won eleven as well. They tied it. Yeah, they tied it. They tied it. It's like a three-way tie uh, uh, of uh, films that won multiple that many Oscars. Now, as far as you know, this book is where you know this book right here. The book that we we kind of use as our Bible for uh, doing the fifty two must see movies and why they matter. It's very selective on the films that it has in there, but it does have some of the all time great films, and I consider Ben Hur one of the all time great great films. But some people, because of the message, it kind of hits you over the head. With oh yeah, about Jesus and it's you know, it is heavily. Um... Uh, Christianity has a heavy presence in this movie. When I mean biblical epic, this is like New Testament biblical epic. It's it, it's heavily, uh, uh, I don't think Christified the word, but there's a heavy Christian presence in the movie. And that's going to turn off a lot of people who aren't Christian, uh, who are of other faiths or other religions, or who are atheists or whatever you are. I mean, personally for me, I, you know, I'm not a follower of Christianity anymore, so the film does... You know, it doesn't bother me so much because you have to put this film in context of when it came out, what the movie is about, and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of factors playing into it, but yeah, it is very heavy-handed, and, and epics aren't for everyone. You know, they, they're kind of they're kind of for a certain type of taste in film, especially old biblical epics like this. You know, you know, like we mentioned throughout, they it is not like a modern film. You know, it's much more slow-paced. Uh, when it comes to you know all of the events in the film, there's a lot happening, and it is long three 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 and a half hours is a long movie for most people, whether it's a movie from 1959 or a movie from now. Yeah, and w one of the things uh, they did do well back in the 60s and the 50s and so forth is sword and sandal movies. I feel like back in the day that genre was really a thriving genre, and nowadays we just don't do that genre very well for whatever reason. I like Troy, but of course, Gladiator was the one that really brought that genre back. And it was Gladiator brought it back, and people <laughs> like, just tried to copy it ever since, and it's not working. I think back then, a lot of the genres that were big hits were were big hits because they were new: western, sword and sandals, you know, spaghetti westerns, because they were brand new. No one had ever seen these before. And but we've seen sword and sandal epics in the past. We've seen westerns and whatnot, and they keep trying to make them. I mean, like I just said, the, the, they just made a new Ben Hur movie uh, two years ago, <laughs> and and no one really wanted. No, there was not really a market for it, and no one really cared too much for it. No, and, and it wasn't very good either. Um, but what I was gonna, what I was getting at was Gladiator is kind of like a. If you really pay attention to Gladiator and Ben Hur, there's a lot of similarities in the films, and 
one of the things that why these movies are in this book and why Robert Osborne uh, featured these movies and the people that selected these films uh, on the essentials is because they are essential and there's reasons why they pick these films. They, a lot of films try to copy films like this. And Gladiator is one that kind of, even though Gladiator is a phenomenal film on its own, I think Ridley Scott really took some notes, some beats from Ben Hur and put them into uh, Gladiator. But that's, there's such a great, these, these films are such great films a lot. They, they, they honor, they are honored by other filmmakers trying to make similar types of films. And Ben Hur is one, is probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest sword and sandal film of all time. And a lot of other filmmakers try to copy uh, Ben Hur, but they just can't even, like you said, they've done TV shows shows that had a Ben Hur out last year. They just can't come close to even thinking about getting the epic scale, the drama, the story, the just everything that went into this film. And that's why it's such an essential film for all film fans and all, all yeah. cinephiles out there. Yeah, it, it, yeah. The, the audiences are also much different now than they were back then. Like I was just mentioning, the three and a half hour runtime. Not lot, there aren't a lot of three and a half hour movies being made today. You know, the epic. You know, we talk about Sword and Sandal, but the epic in itself is not much. Doesn't have much of a presence today either. But this, like you said, Dan, this movie is is on this list for a specific reason. It is in, in just a a massive, impressive epic for its time. It's different than um, a lot of the other films coming out at its time. And it, it, it is foundational for, like like you said, generations later, people grew up watching Ben-Hur. And it became, you know, inspiration for a lot of filmmakers and a lot of people. And it is a very good movie. It, like I said earlier, it's not my favorite epic. Uh, we'll be talking about a couple of more epics um, coming up soon in Gone with the Wind and Lawrence of Arabia. And so the epics were around, or there were a lot of epics out there to go through. But we're talking on uh, just a couple of them in this film. Yep. All right, Andrew. Um, I just want to say thank you for being on this episode uh, where we had a chance to talk about this great uh, film called Ben Hur. Uh, where can you be found? Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at Cabzilla06, as well as my YouTube channel, Cabzilla Productions. And you can find me at Dan Skip Allen on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And hopefully, uh, Next week, you might see me again, or the week after that, and you <laughs> might see Andrew again, and you might see Steven again. We have a few more episodes to go. We, uh, we're getting down to it. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, this has been an, a fun year to do all these great films with uh, Andrew and Steven. So for Steven, I mean, for Andrew and myself, good night.